So as we are now at Revelation chapter four, um, what what I kind of want us to do and what I, and, and really preparation for us to move through, um, if you've read the book of Revelation, you're going to notice there's a, a I'm going to call it a shift in the writing from chapter three to chapter four. Um, you're kind of in this more narrative, you're in a series of letters, and then all of a sudden in chapter four, it changes. And the change is more on the prophetic, on the visionary side of things. And so what I'm going to suppose in our time together today is that the rest of Revelation um, needs to be read in such a way that's viewed from the three le from the letters to the churches in chapters two and three. Um, so as we continue our study together, that we have to realize that this is a letter that's first and foremost applicable to them. Um, Revelation chapter one, verse one would say that the, the things that must soon take place, um, and then one verse three would say that you need to take those things to heart, uh, that the initial audience would be the primary recipients of, recipients of the message. However, that also, that, that does not exclude us from being recipients of the message. It's just, we have to think first and foremost, what was the initial audience supposed to gather? And then we can hopefully build some revelation or some uh, connection, uh, and some application that would be fit, fitting for us today. As we think of the seven churches, we have the church in Ephesus um, in chapter two, verses three and four. It says that you have endured hardship, but you were forsaken. You have forsaken your first love. Um, we have the church in Smyrna. Uh, that don't be afraid for what you're about to suffer. Be faithful to the point of death. Chapter two, verse 10. The church in Pergamum, you remain true to my name, a blessing. Chapter two, verse 13. Thyatira is uh, this idea of perseverance. Hold on until I come and you will be overcomers. That's chapters 2, 19, 25, and 26. Um, the church in Sardis, he who overcomes, chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, to the church in Philadelphia, uh, they kept my word and they endured patiently, chapter 3, 8, and 10. And then finally, to the church in Laodicea, they were called to repent from their accommodation uh, of the world around them uh, that they were told to him who overcomes, chapter 3, verse 21. When you hear those seven churches and the promises or the, the uh, commendations that are made to them, what are two things that you hear that are very common or similar between those seven churches? struggles with their faith struggles with their faith i was going to say he praises them for what they're doing right but he also points out a few things where they need to improve or repent so the the, the two things we see is we see one we see a series of praises of things that they are doing right because every church has something that they're doing and so they are to be faithful and we are are glad that they are faithfully enduring the two, two of them received, received really good praise. The other thing that we see that's very common is the shortfall. And what is the common shortfall for all the churches? They turned away from their first love. They fell from their first love. Um, I'm going to say that they began to accommodate the world more than they began to accommodate God. They began looking towards how do we make our life easier for us. Um, so we, we typically hear that Revelation has this theme of, of we win, which is a very true statement. Um, Revelation comes about the point of God is one and therefore why be, are we worried? But Revelation also carries the idea that we should be aware of who are, if we are the we people. Because if you're not part of the faithful ones, if you're not part of the people who are being diligent, as chapters two and three have said, what's then the commendation or what's then the warning? The warning is to repent. Repent. Change your life. That's the call. And so we have 
as much as we may want to say Revelation is the account of God winning the cosmic, spiritual, uh, whatever you want to call it, battle, war, it's also a message of warning for those who are not with God in that battle, for those who have uh, forsaken their first love. So if you're going to be faithful, keep on going. But if you are not being faithful, there is a warning. We see that the early church had a struggle of letting the world infiltrate them. And that's the common, that's the common theme through chapters two and three. What we see as we begin to transition into chapter four is that John is sharing uh, a different view. Oh, put my hand on this thing. Um, he begins to show a different view of the world. And it's a different view that's, that's not through the human eye. It's through a spiritual eye. So it's, it's a perspective of what life is like in the spiritual or the heavenly realm. When we did Hebrews, um, you may remember some of the time we spent talking about um, this idea of what of what they fashioned here on earth were the things that were really fashioned in heaven, that they took images that they saw and they created them here. Um, I'm going to say that's what John is taking us to is really the glimpse of what heaven is and what he sees there. Um, as we open into Revelation chapter four, I do want us to do our, our traditional reading of the text. So if someone would be willing to read Revelation chapter four, um, the entire chapter, it's only 13, 11 verses, yeah, 11. I'll do it. Thank you, Laura, At your, whenever you're ready. It says, after this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under, their, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy or our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will, they were created and have their being. Thank you, Laura. Um, <clears throat> as we begin, there there is an idea that um, chapter four is the sign or is, is kind of an image or is a picture of what the rapture would look like. Um, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to take the approach that that's not the best way to interpret chapter four. Um, and the reason that I'm taking that approach is if you'll notice verse one, it says that, um, um, actually it says verse one and two, it's that John is in some way here on earth and he looks up, and as he's looking up, he sees the heavenly realm, 
and then he's called or told to come up to here. And, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know if he's in a bodily form taken up to this, this place, if this is purely visionary dream or what, but my, my current take on it is that we're going to be examining this text at more from how does it apply to, this, to the seven churches? What does it give to them? And so instead of looking at it purely for a rapture, uh, end of times, futuristic view, um, even though, like I said, that, that is a possibility, but I think based upon the way that John opens the chapter, it lends us to the idea that this is more something John experiences and therefore he is sharing. Um, we know that when it comes to revelation and apocalyptic literature, um, there are really kind of uh, two types uh, that we're going to experience. The first type is a direct discourse of otherworldly beings, which you kind of experience in Revelation 1 and 1 through 3. And then there are otherworldly journeys, uh, things that are outside of this world, and that's going to be Revelation chapter 4 and following. Um, the throne room, which is where we are at, and I want you just to, just for a moment, I want you to stop and I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture what Laura read. Um, or if you want, feel free to, to, to scan over the text and to see what, what imagery is being used. Um, how do you feel? You'd have to be in a sense of awe. Uh, this is similar, at least, to what Moses saw on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24, 9 and 10, you know, when it's described. Yeah. And think about, I have another verse here in a minute coming from Ezekiel, but, but uh, I didn't think about Moses, but that the sense of awe, sense of awe what else what else did you as you're as you're picturing this scene what other feelings or emotions do you sense well it's got to be huge to have 24 thrones and then 24 elders sitting on them requires i would think a lot of space so it's got to be a big massive room I mean, imagine, is it Kentucky Yum Center? That's a pretty big place. I mean, imagine a, a big place where you do have all these thrones. That is, that's a good, it's like, you're probably not looking forward and seeing all of it. It's probably one of those things that your, your peripheral vision seeing a lot of what's going on. I'll picture a, a, a big flat piece of glass yes. and it's all, it's just slick and you don't see nothing but light all around and the thrones in the middle and then the other thrones are around it but you don't see no sides no ends mm -hmm. it's just light all around you know listen hear, hearing you chris I, I i'm i'm almost picturing like an island in the middle of all this just perfectly glass water huh I want us to think about the vision of what we see because, because I, I believe that we could very easily spend the entire time trying to analyze every single aspect of the text. And I don't believe that John wants us to do that. I believe that John wants us to see it. I believe he wants us to understand a fairly simple message from it. And I believe he wants us to move on. Um, you know, John's not giving us, um, what, at least my understanding, John's not giving us this this play-by-play -play step of what the end of time is going to look like. He's not giving us what it's going to look like to approach the throne room, to approach the judgment seat, to approach any of those things. I think what he is doing here is he's giving us a vision of who God is. Yes. Notice, it says, after I looked up, behold, the door was standing open what would that mean and here i said just a moment ago i don't want us to analyze every single thing but 
Why is the door open? An invitation. Come. Access. An invitation. Access. I mean, when, when I when I go to, I've, I've been over to Roger's house, probably the last house I remember going to, and uh, and even in, in a COVID time period, we sat out on the front porch for a moment, and then Roger said, why don't you come on in? Oh, it was, he had just got the house, so I wanted to show him, so I show him, so I show him. He wanted to show us around. I got tongue-tied there. Sure, sure, sure. And when someone wants to show you around or when someone wants to bring you in, what do they do? They're showing you hospitality. Hospitality. What's the first thing they do though? They want to give you something door. to eat or drink? They open the door. Oh, open the door. <laughs> you're, you're, you're already in the house. Well, Laura's already in the door. Already she's, in, man. she's already there. I, I'm thinking, have, have you ever been to someone's home where they didn't want to open the door? Well, they cracked it a little bit. Yeah, cracked it a little bit, said, hey, I, I, I have a, it's not a funny story. I went and visited a lady one time. This was years ago. I went to visit and uh, I knocked on the, the door of the house. She lived in a little single wide trailer. It was an older trailer. And you know, those older trailers, you can hear people walking. Well, I knock on the door and I hear footsteps walking through the house. So I'm like, oh, she's coming to the door. No, and then I, I'm like, oh, well, Maybe she didn't hear me, so I knock again, and then I notice that someone's peeking through the, the blinds, but they are not, they're not coming to the door, and so I realize then that I am not welcome. Here we have an open door, which is this access to God. It's a door that is granted for people to enter into the heavenly realm, and so John is being let into this heavenly reality, and these are the things that, since it's a heavenly realm, uh, we're in Revelation chapter 4. Since it's a heavenly realm, it, it is forever true. This, this is not changing. This is the way it is all the time. And so when we come to verses 2 and 3, what do we see? Who is on the throne? It's not a trick question. I guess it would be God. God's on the throne. Now, it's not really given a great description of, you know, like, like we read earlier when we were talking about Jesus with hair like wool and all this other stuff. We're just given some very basic ideas here, but the only, the, the obvious answer is God is the one on the throne. And so we have, I'm assuming it's a central throne with 24 thrones around it so why why is the throne the first thing that john has shown and why are there then 24 thrones that encircle or, or surround the primary throne you know i don't know i don't know if i understand the 24 thrones but from the beginning the gate was open and i think what John is portraying here, or whether God's spirit is portraying it to him, that the gate is still open and God sits its throne. I think he's just backing up what what it was in the beginning in the garden. So now, you know, that's the thing that I see with the door. That's that's it is open, and if we were to. This is, this is me reading later into Revelation. God is the one, or Jesus is the one that has allowed that door to be open, to give us that access. And, I, and I'll be honest, we, I've got some notes here on the thrones, Chris, that, I want, that we're actually working our way into. I don't know if I have a good answer for why 24 of them. But let, let, let's just, before we get to that discussion, why would there be 24 or 25 thrones? I'm gonna say 25 thrones. What what would that what would that image show to a group of people? God's yeah. about community. Okay, I would have thought community. That's not the answer I'm looking for, but that's I, I like it that there are people around God. Hmm. 
if you think about the 12 apostles and then the 12 tribes of Israel, it's that, in her word, community, uh, that the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God form one community. There is one people of God. I'll just find a different direction than I was planning to go in. <laughs> I would I would say it, 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 it would point to something as far as sovereignty or rule or hierarchy or how does that work together with who's in charge, who's worthy, uh, is he the one on the throne? Not, not saying y'all are wrong because I like where y'all are at and I see it. Roger's picking up what I was picking up. Am I picking up here on audio? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 19 that the 12 apostles would sit on thrones and he would be seated on the throne. Um, I don't know if that connects with this passage or not, but it kind of uh, connects with Greg's comment about the apostles and the 12 uh, tribes together. It covers 12 of the 24. Well, and, that, and that's where, like I said, I, I'm kind of pushing that for just like two minutes later in the conversation. But uh, so before we get to thank you, Mike, very much for that. Uh, the first thing that I would think when I see 25 thrones sitting around is this is a place of, of complete control. This is, this would be really the place of power. And, and the reason I'm going to, I'm going to pull that thought is, is you have some very beautiful descriptions, Jasper, Carnelian, uh, rainbow, like emerald lightning and thunder. You've got the seven spirits are the seven lamps, the seven spirits of God. You have a sea of glass. So all of these things are, are pointing in, in, in just a, a casual thought are pointing to the power and the true control of God. And the reason I think that's important is you've got seven churches who struggle to see the control of God. Go for it, Chris. Thank you. So it is that they're all facing the one throne. It could be 12 thrones facing the one throne. The one throne still has. And, and so I see that in a world where where people are struggling to see the one throne, to see God sitting, John's first image after the struggle in chapters two and three is of the throne or the thrones. Now, moving into into where where we're where y'all are at, Mike, where you were getting us at too, is comes into to why 24 of these things. Well, first off, these, these all the elders are dressed in white. Uh, what would be your quick assumption to why they're dressed in white? Pure, they're sure. victorious. Pure, victorious. They're clean. Well, it, we'll just leave it at that. But as we look at these 24 thrones, uh, probably the best, um, the best example comes from where Greg was leading us and, and where Laura was starting us uh, was this idea of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Now let's jump forward to Revelation chapter 21 real quick. Mm -hmm. Revelation 21, verse 12. Yeah, I guess that's where I want to start now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. 12 through 14. Uh, would someone read Revelation 21, 12 through 14? It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of, of the Israelites. On the east, oh, wait a minute. On the yep. east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations, and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Oh. So who, who's the 12th one? 
Greg, why do you have to go off and ask a question? First, you said, uh, first, when if, when Greg asked that, I thought, well, of course, we all know the 12th. Oh, Judas. <laughs> Greg, I don't have time to answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> Greg, if you didn't hear Greg, Greg's question was, well, who's the 12th? Who's the 12th apostle? Why don't we have 12 and 11? I guess with that being said, though, um, you would actually have 13 tribes with the, uh, uh, half what, yeah, the half tribe of Manasseh. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> maybe that's where you fill in the difference. Um, you know, so as, as we look back to Revelation 4, we see 24 thrones. Um, if, if we're going to build the connection between Revelation 21 and here, it is this idea of the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes. And Laura, I love the idea that, that God's not sitting there by himself. It's not him in isolation. It's him with the people that he is closest to. I like that. Mm -hmm. And so to see God in this place of, of I hate to say co-ruling, because I don't want to be little God, but in a place where he is co-ruling with all these other people, it is a beautiful image. And we have that image that then leads us into uh, these four creatures um, that are around um, around the throne, ar around these thrones, um, you know, there, there's some, there's some comment or question about, are, are these, are these cherubim? Uh, you know, oftentimes we think of cherubim probably as like, like fat little babies floating around and, um, and I don't know, you know, what these exactly are. Um, you know, some, some, uh, ideas came from that they were the ones who guarded the tree of life in the garden of Eden, um, that they might've been part of the mercy seat of the covenant, which is first Corinthians six, um, 23 through 28. The, the part that I actually want us to spend just a brief moment looking back to would be Ezekiel chapter one. One, two, one and two. It'd be one and two, but Ezekiel 1 is the, the primary text I'm thinking of for where these exact four kind of come up. Um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Ro Roger, does this text seem familiar to you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's, uh, let's start at probably verse 8 and read through 12. Would someone read, this is Ezekiel 1, 8 through 12. I got it. Thank you, sir. Under their wings, on their, on their four sides, they, they had the hands of man. All four of them had faces and wings, and their wings touched one another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a man, and on the right side had the face of a lion, and on the left side had the face of an ox, and also had the face of an eagle. Such were their face, um, such were their faces. Their wings were spread out and upward. Each had two wings, one touching the wing of the other creature on the other side, and two wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead wherever the spirit would go. They would go without turning as they went. Thank you. Well, it's a weird image. I, don't, I really have a hard time grasping it. And maybe I don't have to, I, I won't focus on Ezekiel today. But <clears throat> as we look at the, the similarity between Ezekiel 1 and, and Revelation 4, we see the same four animals pretty much used as descriptions uh, among the two texts. I don't think that's, if you're being transported to the same heaven, to the same presence of God, I think you'd see the same animals there. Um, but as we see these four creatures encircling the throne, we see the elders. What, what, what are the lines or what, what do you feel? What, do you, what comments are the, the beast saying? What are they doing? What's their role? To praise, um, to praise God. He's holy. 
to praise and worship and glorify God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. That's And they do that how often? Day and night, continually. Continually, day and night. And, and then let's jump to now the elders for a moment. What's their role, their purpose, or their function? They sit in places of honor, but they also fall down and worship the one on the throne in the center, God. So I like the way you said that. As much honor as they may have from sitting on a throne, their real role is subservient, is throwing themselves yet again in a place of worship, in a place of, of service to uh, the one who sits on the throne. So we have these beasts and we have these elders. The imagery yet again is of a, of a, of a sea, like glass that's as calm as can be. Um, the way I'm going to summarize this, this imagery for a moment, uh, it comes from uh, Beasley Murray, who was a uh, rabbi, uh, or he, he kind of quotes it from Rabbi, I guess, Abua, A-B-A-H-U, uh, who wrote in 300 AD. And he basically said that the mightiest of the birds was the eagle, the mightiest of the domesticated animal was the ox. The mightiest of the wild animals was the lion. And the mightiest of all of these was the human being. And so he then says that God has taken all of these, secured them to his throne. And in each one of these, it is the symbol of the strongest within their class that has been brought to service of God. So, uh, and that even comes with the idea of the sea. Um, the sea for... Their time was a wild and, and savage place. And so to see the sea as calm and as clear as glass would have meant that God had, had complete domain and control over it. To see these four animals that do nothing but praise God would see that they are being brought under the control of God, that everything in the presence of God is under his control regardless of how wild we may think they are. Another passage that you, uh, at least in the praise part of it, is Isaiah 6. Um, when when uh, Isaiah sees the throne room, or, well, is in the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, behold, I'm a man of unclean lips. Yeah. And I dwell among people, and I, my eyes have seen. Yeah, and the uh, creatures that are there are crying out, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So you see these, these symbols or these, he doesn't see, he doesn't see God himself. He sees the train of his robe. And Ezekiel doesn't see God, sees his throne. And get the same here in John. Yeah. Our revelation. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. To see that <clears throat> that each of those two, the two previous examples and this example here, um, are showing the power of God. Which, if you're going to come up off of chapters two and three, to a group of people who have felt. Um, that their God might be no longer as controlling as they once was. This is a beautiful and a powerful image of where their God's at. The question I want to leave you with on our last, we got about five minutes left in our class, and we may wrap up early, but the question I'll leave you with, or the question we can discuss now, is how does this image of our God, um, how should that change our worship? How should that maybe, and, and maybe change the bad word, how should that inform our worship? Should be in reverence and awe. Reverence and awe. Thank you, Mike. I was going to say, <clears throat> he wants us to see him with the reverence, awe, uh, him in his full glory. 
but he also wants that intimate, I'm your father, I'm your dad. And he wants that intimate relationship as well. So. And with that idea that she just expressed there, you go back to that Ezekiel, um, Exodus passage, then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven of, for clearness. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Also, they beheld God, and they ate and drank. So there's a sense that you're in the presence of God and you do the common things. You eat, you drink, you do everything in the presence of God. If that makes any sense. Which is what he wanted in the beginning <clears throat> because he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and he talked with them, you know, well, we don't know what he talked about, but but obviously he knew when you know they messed up and they were hiding from him he was like where are you where are you because he knew but then see they were hiding from him so i think the same relationship he wants to walk with us talk with us eat with us commune with us but i still see him as the almighty the sovereign lord yeah i'm gonna say that, you know, that he said doors open. He said, i'm a jealous god but i'm a loving god mm -hmm. and It's a, I heard it once described, um, am I, I don't know if I'm, Mike, we can hear you. Okay. I heard it once described, it'd be like if, you're, if your father was the president or the king, he would still be the king, but he's your daddy. So how does this awesome description of God's heavenly throne inspire awe in us today. Who wants to miss out on that? <laughs> I love it, Laura. I love it. Who wants to miss out on that? I think the, the challenge that I would leave you with as we wrap up here is I think we talked last week about how the, the seven churches, um, we are very similar to many of them. Um, maybe, in our, maybe in our weakness, maybe in our faith struggle, maybe in whatever, we, we find ourselves, we find our story in their story. And if we can then view our God as the all-powerful, as the one who truly sits on the throne, as the one who has conquered all things and why in the world do i cower to other things why do i cower to other struggles in this life if chapter four describes my god i think that's the application or the struggle point for us to take home with us mm -hmm. any final thoughts or comments before we end this part of our class just visualize the one thing, the open gate, the throne, and then think. He said, forgive them 70 times 7. That's a God that's he's really working toward you coming through that gate. Hmm. And he wants you to come through that gate. Else you know, the interesting, the interesting thing, if you study ancient religions or I guess you even study some of the, the new stuff, there are very few God. Actually, I don't think there's a God one, correct me if I'm wrong, who said, I'll overlook your problems. I'll find a solution for your problems. You come here and be with me. Most every one of them wanted us to give them a whole bunch of stuff and then they gave nothing in return. Thank you all very much for your time together.
Um, we're going to wrap up right now. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, if you're staying around for the ladies' Bible class, feel free to go ahead and hang on. Um, if you're jumping off, feel free to jump off too, but um, we'll go ahead and be uh, in a break here until 7.30. Thank you very much.